cool. Hi everyone, welcome to Inside the Photographer's Mind. My name is Chris Gambit, I'm the Editor-in-Chief of The Photographer. For the past nine years, we've been working really hard to bring you guys some of the best reviews, tutorials, features, and interviews in the photo space on the web. This show is an extension of those interviews where we take the photographers that we've been working with and we find a way to make it a little bit more interpersonal and a lot more candid than we've framed online. And today, for our, yeah, we've been doing the show for around one year now. For our one year show, we are interviewing Olympus visionary and photojournalist photographer Frank Smith. Please welcome Frank with me. Thanks. How you doing, Frank? Doing well, thanks, Chris. Appreciate that. Yeah. How was your commute in? It was easy peasy, so no problem. That sounds pretty awesome. Yeah. So let's get right into this. Talk to us about how you got into photography. Well, I have one person to blame, and that's my grandfather. Uh, as a young boy, he, uh, he was a photographer himself, and I would emulate him no matter where he went. Whatever he did, I followed him, and in the process, I guess I'm learning about composition, light, and so forth, uh, and he was a photographer here in New York, and uh, I would have to say he was the primary influence. So do you come from a line of photographers? Like, was your dad a photographer as well, too, or no? My dad was not a photographer. Oh, okay. Uh, he my, must skip a generation, because my dad had wanted nothing to do with it, and uh, my grandfather, like I said, he, he did it all the time, and I just followed him wherever he went. That makes a whole lot of sense. So then... From what type of photography did he do? He did mostly studio work, and uh, you know, for the, it worked, was called the, back in the day the New York Advertising Agency, and it was you know props and things like that that he would photograph for that organization. So, when you first got into it, what really got you hooked? Like, do you remember the specific image that you shot that was like, oh, this is really something that I want to do with the rest of my life? Well, it's less about the image and more about the time that I was doing my own developing and by magic all of a sudden I saw this image start to appear on a piece of paper that uh, just totally you know, uh, jazzed me up to the extent that I said I want to do more of this. So that was probably one of the pivotal events in my life that got me interested in this. And then, I mean, he did street studio photography but then you have been doing photojournalism work and landscape work and all that. I mean, that's quite change because I mean with studio photography you have a lot of control over everything versus photojournalism it's like you're sort of adapting yes so I mean your mind when it came to doing photojournalistic work uh, what made you want to do that versus the studio type of work that you were so used to seeing well I guess at the time I didn't know what my grandfather shot uh, for <laughs> professional because where I shot with him was on family vacations and things like that so my environment when I was with my grandfather was always outdoors somewhere as opposed to what he actually did so I never had the benefit while I was young knowing specifically what he actually did for a living Ah. That makes a whole lot So I melded my own, you know, just based on, you know, some of those trials and errors. Yeah. So then every photographer, when they're first starting out, they're usually, like, enamored with someone's work, and they try to emulate it quite a bit. And, I mean, you started with your grandfather, but what other photographers do you feel really influenced you? Well, you know, over the years I studied several of the kind of the masters, if you will, in the past, but one person, it's actually a woman, her name is Margaret Borg-White, really I enjoyed her photography, she influenced me, and I also had the opportunity to uh, interface with a photo of John Isaac, he was the uh, head photographer at the United Nations for 20 plus years, and mm -hmm. he played uh, an important role in, you know, in some of um, the things that we did together, so he was, a, he was a, an important piece to it also. Can you talk about some of the work that you and John did? Well, you know, it, this is going back, uh, I don't know, 15, 20 years, I'm not even sure of the time frame, but uh, when we first met, uh, uh, we, we both shot Olympus, so that was an immediate bond there, and uh, the areas that he traveled to were at places that were of interest to me, so I had the opportunity to travel with him in many parts of the world back in the day, and that was a, that was a big part of it. Now, do you still see John and other photographers' influences in your work today, or do you feel like you've really been a person that's come into his own in many ways. Uh, obviously you have, but I mean, when you still look back at your images, because I mean, sometimes I will look back and another photographer, I know they will look back at their images and they're like, yeah, I see my influence from Albert Watson in there or something like that. Do you still see like sort of 
those influences yes at all? and but I will tell you it's evolved to a point where I think it's more specific to me today but clearly there's still a foundational base from some of the people that I've studied or some of the people that I've worked with over the years okay. absolutely that was an influence but I think that has culminated now into a style that's unique to myself that makes a lot of sense. So you don't really hear John's voice in your head at all? Well, on Sometimes. a few things, there's a couple times where I'll, I will, but for the most part, it's my own voice now talking to me. That makes a whole lot of sense. So when someone looks at your images, I mean, we're going to be showing off a whole bunch of stuff that you've done. We're right now showing off a lot of the work that you've done from India, but you've also done a lot of landscape work and interior work and all that stuff. When someone looks at your images, what do you feel is really token to your work. When I look at it, how do I know that this is a Frank Smith? Well, one of the things, and I teach a fair amount of classes, is I always talk about looking at the unobvious. And when I photograph, my immediate reaction is to do, like most people, is take the broad picture of the scene, whatever that might be. But then I allow myself to break from you know, what I thought my intentions were and turn 180 degrees, and many times I've found that that's where the uh, the action is, if you will, for what I'm trying to photograph. But where I'm going with this is then, after I take that broad scene, I start to focus in more and more and more and look at components or stories that are in the image, and that's where I ultimately try to get my images to go. And I think that's a big part of what my images will show. Sounds like it's a very slow process in a world that's usually very quick. Well, you know, one of the things I tell people is that patience is a very important part for successful photography, and I admit I'm not very good at it, but I have learned to tell myself that in order to be successful with it, I need to do that. And by way of example, a lot of times there are things that will move into the image, and the image can be that much more interesting if you wait for whatever that potential activity is to mm -hmm. come into the scene and then capture it. Uh, a lot of the images that I've shot in India, you know, there's people peeking behind doors and stuff like that, and I'll just become a fixture there where they know I'm not going away, and then ultimately they'll come into the scene and I'll capture the image that I was trying to capture. Ah, yeah, I've heard about this uh, this method. It's usually called these days like a photo wait. Yeah. Like you sit there and you just wait for something to come yep. in. Sometimes it's a stray beam of light. Sometimes it's an actual person. Yeah, absolutely. Or something like that. But there are times too where it's an immediate. You know, there's something that occurs and you know you've got split seconds and you need to be prepared to obviously capture that in that particular situation. Now just now you were talking a little bit about your career. So how long have you been shooting? Wow. Well, you know, I, I have a, an image that I show a picture of me photographing my brother where he has one candle on, uh, on the cake and uh, I ask people, and so let's do the math, there's two years between us. So. I have it documented that I started when I was three years old, so I've been doing it for 15 years. Okay. I'm being sarcastic, of yeah. course. No, I've been doing it pretty much all of my life. Okay. So then over your years, let's say in your professional career as a photographer, where you've been making taxable income from it, um, what do you feel some of the biggest changes and most important changes were in your career? Let's say three. And you've been shooting for a really long time. Yes, so, well, you don't have to emphasize really long, but uh, oh, yes, okay. you're right. <laughs> well, I mean, part of it is, is uh, as you mature with your photography, there are tips and tricks that you learn along the way where, you know, I'd go out on a shoot in, in uh, years past and I might come back with 10,000 images. Well, I'm half or a quarter of what I used to do back then because I now have a better understanding of what I'm ultimately trying to get as, instead of maybe guessing on some of the things. The other thing is with technology, uh, particularly on some of the things uh, with respect to architectural work that I do. And with that, I used to have to carry a much bigger you know, cadre of uh, equipment where today, because of technology, I'm, I have a greater dynamic range. I have smaller light options available to me where I can get things on an interior in an easier fashion than I would have been able to do many years ago. And how do you feel the business part of it has changed? Well, I mean, I, you know, I'm not going to kid you. It's, it's more challenging because everybody's a photographer today. Anybody who has a cell phone, you know, they can classify themselves as a photographer. So I think it's important for us as photographers to rise above that and really show the importance of what it is by proper composition using, again, the, today's technology. And there's a reason why our imagery is important as compared to the person just taking the cell phone shot. And it's fantastic that you're saying that, because my next question is really something that I ask every photographer. It's really about, I have this idea that 
every photographer, you're either a person that documents or you're a person that creates. And the people that document are usually ones that passively just take a photo, let's say, of this camera or my coffee, and I'm going to post it to Instagram and probably get like a thousand likes or something like that. And then the ones who create are really the ones that, you know, try to control almost every element of the scene. So for you, it sounds like there's a combination of both the creator side and the documenter side. But, I mean, do you feel it has always been like this equilibrium? Or do you feel like at one point you were more of a documenter or more of a creator? I mean, how do you really think about that and define yourself? Well, I will tell you, it's for me, it's an even balance. And part of the reason why I say that, too, is in some of the uh, classes that I teach, I break it down into two important things for successful photography. You need to have the right composition and post-process. So, you know, some people will shoot me and say, oh, you don't need to do that. But I will tell you, there isn't an image that you're going to see from me that hasn't been touched in some way, shape, or form. Again, it could be a simple thing of uh, taking a coffee cup out that I forgot in, in an image. But, uh, you know, there's a, the compositional part of it, and then the creative part of it also melds into the post-processing part of it. So it, to me, it's a combination of those uh, pieces that need to make it successful. That makes a lot of sense. So right now we're showing some of your photojournalistic work, and this is work that has been done in India. But we were talking a little bit more about this earlier on, about you know how these are the images that are really safer for the public, and how you've shot a lot of images that you don't necessarily show because it's more philanthropic work, it seems like. So do you mind telling us a little bit about these? Uh, my pleasure. I do what's called philanthropic photojournalistic work. And a lot of my clients uh, are you know, dealing with some very challenging uh, types of situations. Uh, and in some cases, uh, uh, I'm working with a client that uh, is trying to bring more awareness to the sex trade problem. Well, those are images that I'm not going to share with the general public. They're specific for the client. And uh, in, in other cases, uh, you know, I'm doing some work, I've done some work in Haiti where it, with an organization that's trying to bring awareness and raise funds for uh, handicapped children in third world countries. And in those cases, you know, it's, I'm not sharing those images that's client specific. Uh, but in situations where that exists, you know, it's always a challenge because where they're successful, they're raising money, they're making inroads, but then you have a country that doesn't have anything that's handicap accessible. So there's challenges associated with that. Uh, I've done work in Africa uh, with an organization called Alarm, where it has to do with the reconciliation efforts that those countries are still trying to mend. And, uh, in, and in some cases, that has brought me some opportunities to shoot some other things. With uh, the uh, situation in Africa, they had asked me to come over during a time in which South Sudan was going to secede from the north. And they said, would you like us to schedule this during that occurrence? Well, it took me a nanosecond to say yes to that. And uh, I was allowed to be one of two photographers to photograph the birth of a nation. So for me, it was an experience that was just unbelievable. And I'm this close to the commissioners, the generals, and everything. And a uh, quick sidebar to that, though, they said the day before, make sure you dress like a photographer. I had no clue what that meant. But anyway, I understood the next day because they had to do a selection process. And part of it was, I guess, the way we were going to look. And they allowed me and one other fellow. They said, he's an American photojournalist. You let him in here. And they gave me full access to the parade grounds and everything. It was an wait, amazing wait, hold experience. Wait, Back up. So how did you dress? Was there like full photo vest and like hat like this? Well, I didn't have the hat like that. All right, but all I have right. to tell you, I pulled every white balance card I had out, wore it around my neck. And I thought, well, whatever the definition of what a photographer looks like, I'm hoping this fits the build. But something must have worked because they let me in. Did you have like seven cameras around your neck and like I did three have tripods? Multiple, yes. I did have multiple cameras, <laughs> yeah. even though I didn't use them dur during the, uh, the shoot. But uh, yes, that's what I did. <laughs> that's pretty awesome. Yeah. So I was originally going to ask you about travel photography because a lot of these days, what you see with travel photography, the conversation is really about it being invigorating and a great experience and enlightening. But for you, it sounds like there's some goodwill behind it. Mm -hmm. And it seems like there always has been this organic goodwill behind it. Um, so when you take these assignments, have you ever turned anything down because you didn't necessarily feel it was something that you wanted to do? Or, I mean... Well, I think most of the people that know me within that realm know what I shoot and know the type of work that I do. So nobody's ever asked me a question where I felt uncomfortable doing something for them. So I've not had that experience. I've not had to turn anybody down. But again, I think it's because of people knowing what I do. That makes a lot of sense. So when you travel, I mean, 
sometimes there are language barriers. So how do you usually get around that? Do you usually have a translator with you or something like that? Well, again, it depends on the circumstance. Uh, but if I'm doing an assignment, for sure I have a translator or somebody there that can get me through the different places. But a lot of times when I'm finished with that assignment, I might ver venture into areas that uh, allow me some new opportunities. And in those cases, you know, the, the one thing that's international is the handshake or smile or something that's human, the human element where, you know, I try to break those barriers with that. And I'm the kind of photographer when I'm in that environment where I don't just snap the shot, I will try to embed myself into the culture because as much as the photography is important to me, I also want to learn about the culture. I want to know kind of what's in the back of their head. I want to know what makes them different from me, if in fact they are different from me. And then once I've embed myself into that type of scenario, I find people are comfortable, I'm no longer a potential threat, and people are very open then to allow me to photograph, particularly when we can now show them the back of our camera what it is we're shooting, mm -hmm. and that just puts smiles on people's faces and it breaks that barrier, if you will. So you never were one of those photographers that always took like a Polaroid camera with you as well too and just showed them images. Well, I have done that in years past, uh, and uh, less and less now though because of the option with the uh, being able to show them the imagery on the back. Right. And today, even in third world countries, if they have, a lot of people have internet, and I'll say you give me your email and I'll be glad to share with you some of the images, and I've done that and gotten some fun responses from that. So when you were, let's say you were in India and you're showing off these images right now and you were done with the assignment, what were your typical days like when you were just like, I'm guessing you were just meandering around finding them? Well, I'd always have a plan in place because I, I, I will define where I want to go. I mean, India is a big country, so yeah. I have to decide in this last trip, uh, I was in the, in the Rajasthan region and uh, I, uh, the one fellow that I travel with, his name is Abhishek, he's from New Delhi and typically when I'm in India, I would say at least 70% of the time, I'll reach out and we'll arrange to get together and me and maybe a couple of other fellow friends where we'll uh, go out specifically for 18 hours a day of photography and we'll have a map out, you know, a map arranged as far as where we're going to go and the areas we want to get to. But what we do is, and like the, the images you're just seeing on the screen now, you know, those are, you know, we're, we're driving down a back road and we see these people and we're, we're engaging them and, you know, and, and becoming friends first, so to speak and then photographing second. So does that mean your approach when with these people, you probably don't usually have the camera out to begin with or you bring it out gradually and get well, them comfortable? It's, or? it's around my neck, so they know it, they see it, but my first uh, approach is not to lift the camera up. My okay. first approach might be to go shake hands or introduce myself, again, depending upon the language issue, yeah. then I will start to bring the camera up. And many times what I'll do, even before I bring the camera up, I'll turn it around and show them some images of a village that maybe I took some pictures before, yeah. and that's an icebreaker in and of itself. And I think that's so important because a lot of people, you know, when I look around at a whole bunch of tutorials, there's a lot of tutorials about like how to light and stuff like that, but I don't feel like there's enough about how to be a genuine actual person and how to have those people skills. Um, and I think a big part of it is empathy. And I mean, has that been your experience over the past couple of years? Absolutely. And again, we're all human beings and we all bond with certain elements that make things comfortable for us. And for me, that's how I find success in getting the images that I get is, again, I try to be, try to be a, a friend and a person first and a photographer after that. Makes a lot of sense. Now, I have a question for you that I'm actually pretty excited to ask you. So you've been doing all this philanthropic work for years. Tell me about one of the scariest moments that you had as a travel photographer and a photojournalist in these regions. Well, uh, one of those was I've never been in a brothel before, and I mentioned that one of the agencies I work for has to deal with the sex trade, and I was actually in a brothel in a very dark part of uh, Delhi, and it was probably the scariest thing I've ever done. And scary, just not from the standpoint of the potential implications to me, but these women that were bold enough to allow me to photograph them, their punishment is not a whack on the knuckles if they got caught, it was death. So this was some, some serious stuff, this was very, very challenging, and again, it was one of those where, you know, you had to be smart about what you were doing, you had to be looking over your shoulder all the time, mm -hmm. but uh, I would say that probably goes in the book as one of the most scariest moments I've had. Oh, wow, I mean, well, Obviously, this must have been very difficult because one, there's language barriers, and two, there's so many sensitive things that you know you're trying to take photos of and all that. I mean, 
I'm guessing in a situation like that, you didn't necessarily have the camera around your neck. No, I had it in my hand, and you know, the good news for me is I shoot the Olympus system, and it's a smaller, compact system, so I'm not scaring people away with that. It's obvious to them that I had it because you know, I this was with an interpreter and somebody who was able to help me. Yeah. We'd made arrangements to come in. I just isn't, wasn't going to just walk in off the street. Yeah. Uh, and there was an intent and a purpose and that, you know, we tried to map that out as best as we could. But any way you try and plan something like that, that's still a scary situation. Absolutely. And we'll talk about your camera system a little bit later, but what are some things that you always have in your travel bag whenever you go about on these assignments? <laughs> well, one of the things is uh, Imodium. Imodium, <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, uh, and uh, a Z-Pack, because a lot of times I'm traveling in areas where um, the, uh, let's just say the sanitary conditions are a little different than what we're used to here. Uh -huh. And I've gotten sick many times, and I've learned that uh, that's probably one of the most important pieces of, uh, not equipment, but that's one of the most important things in my bag that I need to have with me. Makes a lot of sense. So right now we're transitioning into another uh, I guess field that you shoot, um, no pun intended, but it's about landscape work and a little bit about interiors and all that stuff. So for you, I mean, for me, a part of my job is testing cameras and lenses all the time. And no matter how many times I go to different places, sometimes I feel like landscape photography, with the exception of the light and the weather, it, sometimes it can become monotonous and that's how I feel. But for you, how do you feel you try to keep your landscape photography fresh? Well, I, uh, I try to look at things differently. And it's interesting, some of the ways that I've discovered opportunities with my landscape work is just by having my camera over my shoulder and looking down at the screen, I notice something that it's fo focused on or pointing to, and I realize that there's something that's kind of unique that I might not have seen otherwise. And so for me, as I said earlier on, is I like, I'll photograph the big picture, but then I allow my mind to wander around in the different parts of the scenes. And it's almost like, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm on, a, on a gold uh, hunt, uh, if you will, where I'm looking for these nuggets to show up in different places. And that's where I find a lot of the magic is just by breaking away from the norm and starting to focus in or moving in on different subjects. And it's really interesting, too, because we were also talking about technology and how it's changed over the years. And I think that, you know, in some ways, that's really fundamental to photography. Like, for example, Olympus has all these art filters. Um, and there's been panoramic uh, abilities that have been built into cameras over the years. Do you ever sit around and just mess around with those just for fun? Absolutely. And, you know, one of the uh, workshops I just did uh, in, in, Al in uh, Arbor, I said to the folks that were in a class that had this this equipment or even other equipment is there's an art mode and it allows you to bracket where you can see 10, 20 different types of results with one hit of the shutter button and people were blown away because it does all these different things. And I think that gets people jazzed up to think, well, wait a minute, maybe I should be looking at this if it was a black and white, or maybe I should be looking at this, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, a different vignette or something like that. Yeah. And it's amazing what the cameras today can provide in that. And it gives us a new opportunity to kind of get our juices flowing that we might not have seen another way. How many people just stuff the camera in grainy black and white mode? Well, a lot of people. Yeah. <laughs> I was about to say. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We absolutely. do that on press trips all the time. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Because it's beautiful. Um, so for your landscape photography, a lot of landscape photographers, they draw influences from painters and from other uh, works of art. Do you feel like you drew those influences from other places as well? Yes. I mean, if when I, and I get to travel a fair amount, and when I'm in a, a different country or whatever, if there's a museum, I'm typically going to going to go in there and I want to see works of other people, and you know some of the you know some of the influencers I think in that regard are some of the you know the well known painters you know from years past, um, you know I I find myself you know probably being influenced by that with the colors and composition, and uh, and I don't know if you're going to talk about it later but with architecture is M C Escher is a huge influence and I when you'll see in some of my images that you know that you can see where there's some similarities even with some of his work. So, with you, do you feel... I'm taking that in right now because I was also going to ask you about composition later on, but now I might as well ask about it right now. So, when you compose, something that I've noticed, noticed in a lot of your work is there are these like immaculate lines and everything is almost clinical, but still very artistic. So, 
when you were just talking, I'm thinking, so do you compose by color, or are you more about geometry? Or, <laughs> I mean, well, it, it's probably a balance, but probably more geometry and juxtapositioning of things in the image. If it's people, you know, the juxtaposition is significantly more important to me. Yeah. If it's landscape, I'm all about layers. I like, I love layers in my photography. And so I will, if I'm looking at something and there's an opportunity where there are layers in that, that is going to be something where I'll spend time, concentrate on trying to get the right image just with that. Layers as they pertain to color or layers as they pertain to actual objects in the frame? Actual objects, foreground, midground, background, sometimes more background, those sort of things. That makes a whole lot of sense. Okay, well, tell us about some of, because you've done a lot of traveling. I mean, how many countries have you been to? <laughs> I don't know the answer to okay, that. Okay, don't worry a, about it's that. It's a fair don't amount. <laughs> yeah. Um, what were some of your favorite locations to shoot landscapes in the world? Uh, tough question, but one of the places that I would have to say is the Atacama Desert, and most people are not familiar with that. Yeah. It's the largest arid desert in the world. It spans three countries, Argentina, Peru, and Chile, and the very center core of it, there's an area where there was volcanic action you know, a million some years ago, and it only sees a handful of human beings a year. Nothing lives there. It's, it, the temperatures are very, very tough. It's below freezing at night, up to about 100 degrees during the day. But because of this volcanic action, there's all these pumice structures that it looks like, uh, to me anyway, these beautiful architectural structures in the middle of a desert that are popped up all over the place. And it is one of the areas where you know, at night you could touch the Milky Way, at least it feels like that because it's, the air is as pure as can be. It's very remote to get there. It's a, it's a several day drive. You have to bring your own gas, your own water, because like I said, there's no options there. Yeah. That probably goes down in the book for me. It's probably one of the uh, most amazing places to photograph uh, from a landscape perspective. You're talking about it and it almost seems like you're talking about Burning Man, basically. Well, because... except that there's no people. Yeah. Yeah. That's the difference, and these sculptures that are there are all, they're all, um, you know, nature made, if you will. Yeah. And it, what's fun is because of the sand, you can go to this exact same place the next day and try to shoot the same shot, and it'll look totally different because the contours of the sand and everything changes just, you know, with Mother Nature taking over. That makes a whole lot of sense. Now I'm going to ask you a sort of touchy question, hmm. um, at least in the landscape photography world. Do you feel that every landscape needs to be in HDR? Absolutely not. Go ahead and explain why. Well, I think, again, we have tools available to us today, and a lot of it depends on where you are and what time of the day you're there. I mean, if you're, if you're shooting a landscape and it's your only opportunity and it's at high noon and the sun's as bright as can be, you know, you may not have a choice but to uh, shoot it with uh, uh, an HDR in mind because the dynamic range, there isn't a camera made that can capture the full dynamic range of that where you've got shadows and highlights, and the only way you're going to do that is either with HDR or manually create that where you're, you know, you you mask it out and bring in, you know, the the things that the human eye sees uh, from again the highlight and the shadow perspective. So when you go ahead and you create a lot of these scenes, what are some questions that you feel you're constantly asking yourself before you even push the shutter? Well, again, composition, uh, you know, and dynamic range. Is there enough dynamic range, you know, or do I need to take multiple images? Uh, but for me, it comes. It, the basic thing is it comes down to composition, and that's what I'm trying to achieve. And I'll use whatever tools I potentially can. If it's, uh, you know, there's an opportunity to get a starburst, I'm going to, you know, bring down my aperture to create that in the image. Or, you know, again, I mentioned early on about layers. I'm all about foreground and. A lot of times, depending upon what I'm shooting, I want foreground in my image. I want to be able to have something so you can have a depth and an understanding, a better understanding of the image by incorporating that into the imagery. And when it comes to geometry, let's talk about that a little bit more. With lines, um, what are some things that you feel you're constantly thinking about? Uh, for landscapes, for example, obviously, there's the horizon. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, with buildings, you know, it seems like you're really about making sure all of these things are in the frames at just the right places. And the way I'm thinking about you working is really just moving around a whole lot. Yeah, my feet are what helps me create my image. And that's, I will move back and forth multiple times till I find the right composition. But in a landscape scenario, I will try to find where there's opportunities, a frame, a natural frame. 
uh, or again, something in the foreground, uh, depending upon what that image is. Um, in one of the earlier images we showed there was uh, uh, in uh, Leh and Ladakh, uh, in the northernmost part of India, this beautiful uh, Buddhist uh, 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 complex where there's water, there's lakes, there's the, the, uh, the structure, there's mountains, there's skies, all of these layers again, and that, at least from my vantage point, I think helps to create a, a more interesting image. Yeah, I completely agree with you, especially as it pertains to buildings. I mean, some of these images, I was looking at them, and it's like, I can see the scene, and I've shot some of these scenes myself, too, and I'm thinking, okay, well, you know, the way that some cities are laid out, a lot of the color is really monotonous. But to you, when I look at your images, a lot of these colors are very vibrant, and they're not colors I would necessarily think about. So when you're sitting there shooting these scenes, are you trying... Before I even do that, are you more of a phot photographer that you feel your magic comes out in the camera, or do you feel it's more in the post? Well, I hate to give you the same answer I did before, but yeah. it's both. It's and both. Uh, what I have been doing lately, and this is, I teach a couple classes on architecture, and I push the limit. I totally push the limit because many of the clients that I have will say, all right, I need these buildings photographed, and I ask them, I say, can we just be a little more adventurous, a little more avant-garde, and they're like, what do you mean? I said, just, you know, would you allow me some flexibility to look at these buildings differently? And there's usually hesitation. They say, well, yeah, but we still want the other stuff. And yeah. what I mean by that, you know, in true architectural photography, verticals need to be vertical, horizontals need to be horizontal. But I'm finding today more and more art departments, uh, marketing departments, if I present them some images that, you know, where it's a wide angle and it's totally incorrect from perspective, but yet it creates all this interest. And I present those images to the client and nine times out of 10 now, they're taking the image that has incorrect perspective, but is much more interesting than the one where they said they needed the straight lines. And I think it's, you know, the, the way we, the world we're in today is allowing more opportunities because marketing departments are becoming, wanting to be more creative. And for me, I absolutely love that. And even when I get a client that says, no, it's got to be exactly this way, I still take a bunch of shots and give them the other one. And guess what? Most of the time they will accept it, So, which is fun for me. And I just think that's a trend that we're going to see. And I hope it continues in that regard. Yeah, I completely agree because I think that it would change real estate and everything else. Absolutely. So, I mean, for you, the business of interior photographer and real estate and all that, how do you feel that's changed besides what you were talking about with you know, you having more creativity. I mean, the negotiations and everything else like that. And Well, I mean, the hard part if you're looking to get into this business is it helps to know some people and to have a portfolio that you can present to people. And, uh, you know, that's something that takes time and you have to build and develop a relationship with uh, that industry, if you will. And for me, a lot of it has been word of mouth. I don't go out and actively publicize the fact that I do architectural work, but uh, it's, I've been very busy with that. I've been very fortunate. Uh, and again, a lot of it is by referral, but it's getting yourself established and you know, trying some things, to be a little more avant-garde, be a little bit bold and show these things. And it's, you know, it's amazing how you know, they, somebody's gonna look at that and say, I want that for my, my portfolio, or I want that for my marketing team. And for me, that's worked well. And I think that goes back to what we were talking about with you being more of a personable person and the people work and, you know, how that reflects in your photojournalism and everything else. So let's talk about gear finally. What are you shooting with these days? <laughs> I, my workhorse is the Olympus OMD EM1 Mark II. And uh, for what I do, it is, you know, it's, it's I, think, I think they designed it for me. And okay. what I mean by that is you saw, you heard me talk about the photojournalistic work that I do. I travel a lot, I need light, I need portability, but I can't sacrifice quality. And for me, this totally fits the bill. You know, people have said, well, you know, you, how big can you go? I have an, an image that's 11 foot by 20 foot, and I say to those people that if you need to go bigger than that, then maybe you need to look at a different system. But for me, I've had no problems with that. And the clients that I work with, uh, there's never been any kind of issue associated with that. But for me, uh, the glass, the technology, and, and again, I'm obviously um, biased to some extent, but I think the technology in, these, in this equipment is second to none. 
Are you more of a Prime guy or a Zoom guy? Uh, both, but when I'm traveling, it's probably more Zoom because in, in travel and the photojournalistic world, I don't have the ability to move as much as I would like. But when I have the opportunity, like New York is one of my favorite places to shoot, I'll bring the Primes out on that because I can then determine where I want to be and, and I have the time to set up and do that sort of thing. That makes a lot of sense. So, um, yeah, and I'm a wide-angle guy. At the bulk of what I do, you saw in some of the architectural stuff, uh, the 7 to 14, that's, my, that's on the camera probably 95% of the time when I'm doing my architectural. So what's, so would oh, you also say that's your favorite lens as well too? Or? That, that's fair to say. That's fair to say. Oh, wow. I'm more of a 25-1-2 guy. But. Well, but again, it depends on what you're shooting. Again, yeah. For me, the landscape, the architectural work, the 7 to 14, and you know, the second to that would be the 12 to 100, which is 24 to 200 full frame equivalent, and that gives me a huge versatile uh, you know, range, and I'm able to accomplish pretty much with that. So that's the second lens that's on my camera. That makes a lot of sense. So let's talk about future, Frank. So first off, mm -hmm. creatively, where do you see yourself in a year, and how do you see your own work evolving? Well, you know, one of the things I try to do is never allow myself to say, all right, done that, you know, it's, it's over, and not think outside the box. I'm constantly trying to look at different ways to photograph things, changing focal lengths, maybe what you know I've done differently. I did a series on, uh, I was photographed underneath a bridge, and I showed the images uh, with different focal lengths, different post-processing, and until the end, nobody knew it was the same bridge. And the point of that is that by allowing ourselves to break you know, whatever mold we have and just be creative and move about and change things, you know. I want to continue to do that because for me, that really jazzes me up. That gets me going. That's my, you know, that's my sweet spot, and that's what I like to try to do. And business-wise, it's really fascinating because a lot of photojournalists usually end up shooting weddings on the side, but you haven't done that, to my knowledge, have you? Been there, done that. Okay. And uh, and I respect people that uh, do that because that is very, very hard work. And but that's not that's not my thing. I uh, I I'm the areas that I've concentrate on now that's where I, I'm going to continue to do that and uh, I will leave the wedding arena to the people that uh, are specialists in that and that's just you know that's a path that I'm not taking that makes or not sense. going back to I should say understood well Frank thank you so much for your time my pleasure Chris yes. it's been enjoyable and thank you over here at Adorama for the event space thank you on Facebook and uh, we will be back next month take care